Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining. Today we have we have a very exciting session for our May Munch and Learn. Um, my name is Didier, and uh, we'll be uh, having a session today on the new era for software development, embracing large language model tools like ChatGPT for interactive problem solving. Sounds like a <laughs> very attractive uh, topic because we have today a record breaking uh, attendance, or at least registration. Uh, today, I have a, a team of uh, Andrew, Jeff, and Jim to cover that topic. We might run a little bit over time, so um, if you have to leave, don't worry, we'll have the, the replay, but we'll catch everything on, on video so, uh, so we don't miss anything. So let me go quickly through the intro, and then I'll hand over to Andrew for the real content. So um, as part of the HP developer community, we run those monthly pro talks. We have this uh, munch and learn that, that that's one of them, and these are, uh, as I said, monthly thought leadership type of session vendor and product agnostic. Um, and we have a, an upcoming session in June uh, on digital twins uh, metaverse and augmented reality kind of a, an interesting topic again. Um, I don't have the entire list of speakers yet, so I'll, I'll let you know this um, as quickly as possible we will uh, update the campaign, uh, the munch and learn page. For the registration link, I realize it's not there yet, but uh, we'll have it very soon. Um, it was just confirmed yesterday that that particular talk. Oops. Uh, we also have a, another type of session called the meetups. A little more again, they're mostly uh, talks. They are a little more in depth on a particular technology. We have open source topics, development topics, and more. Um, and we have an upcoming session at the end of the month on uh, machine learning development environment uh, by Isha Gokar and from Determine AI and uh, part of HP. So uh, feel free to register for this one. The link, um, the link for, for the meetup is, is up and running. We already have a fair amount of registration there. Feel free to join, of course. Uh, besides talks, we also do a number of other things you might be interested in, in the kind of skill up section. We do uh, something we call workshops on demand. Uh, you can check out this uh, URL here, slash workshops on our Hack Shack. And this is kind of a, a way to learn uh, with hands-on experience. We have a catalog of 33 workshops today on the various topics, language, programming languages, um, products from HP, open source technology, such as Docker or Kubernetes. Uh, they are free. They are available 24 by 7 over the internet. So feel free to give it a try and provide feedback to us. Again, we are operating a, a community here, so we need you to amplify and contribute. So. If you know about other people that want to join uh, our talks, feel free to um, forward the invitation that you receive. Um, join, of course, our other talks. You can also join our monthly newsletter. Um, we have a, a sign up link here, and I think my colleague Denis and Fred will be entering in the Q&A with all those links, so you don't have to, to remember those. Um, you can also, uh, we have a dedicated Slack workspace for development. And for any kind of, we have several channels about uh, the different products and, and technologies available uh, with HPE. So take a look, uh, feel free to ask questions there and answer questions, of course, if you are a subject matter expert. We have a Twitter account also if you are a Twitter person. But if you're a subject matter expert, we're interested because we welcome contribution in the form of blogs. We have a blog section and we have uh, made it easy uh, for people to contribute internally and externally. So you can um, you can share some of the knowledge, some of the subject matter expertise with us. Uh, we use GitHub, we use Markdown, pretty straightforward technology for, for publishing blogs with us. We can also, of course, have you deliver our meetup uh, if this is something that you really want to talk about. And you can also help us propose a workshop on demand on that particular topic. So reach out to us and maybe we can do something together. Um, oops, sorry, uh, wrong slide. Uh, but anyway, we have all these links here. I think Denis has cut and pasted the links also in the Q&A. Um, you can join us on any of these channels. And with that, I don't want to spend more time. And I would like to introduce the, the real topic, the real speakers. And to start with, we'll have Andrew with us. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, everyone, for attending. This is a new era of software development, embracing large language models large language model tools like ChatGPT for iterative problem solving. I'm Andrew Nusma. 
and I'm one of three speakers today. The first question on everyone's mind is, will AI take my job? And the answer is probably not, but it definitely will change it. Um, industry analysts are looking that uh, large language models, chat GPT will probably replace some low skill information workers like customer service, data entry, accountants, HR, um, but it certainly will augment or disrupt um, a lot of different industries, creatives, um, software developers, uh, medicine and education. You may have seen in the news recently that chat GPT was able to pass state bar exams and MCATs, things like that. Um, so I, there is a, a large uh, information space that, um, that large language models are going to disrupt. A little bit about me, I'm a principal cloud developer at HPE. I am a software architect, I lead implementation teams, I do some coding as time allows. And so I'm going to talk about how I use ChatGPT uh, specifically as part of my job. I work on an open source project called Craze System Management. Um, and uh, so the thought that AI might come and augment our jobs isn't really a bad thing. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Worker productivity has stagnated, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And the baby boomers are retiring and global demographics are absolutely shifting. Here's an example of Japan's demographic pyramid. You'll notice that it's upside down. And an upside down pyramid means that there's not enough workers in the pipeline to purchase the goods, uh, to fill the jobs. Um, and so that critically means that a nation's GDP starts to shrink and contract quite noticeably as there's not enough people to continue to produce at the level. And there's crucially not enough people to consume at the level uh, that society has been used to. So chat GPT is a productivity booster um, if you know how to use it. I like to think of it like having um, an infinite number of interns and assistants and deep knowledge about a wide variety of topics, but critically it doesn't know when it's wrong and it doesn't know what it wants, what I want to do and it isn't a mind reader. Um, the reason I'm going to stick with the analogy of an intern, and and the reason for that is uh, we trust interns to be part of our team. We trust them to make decisions, but we don't let them operate autonomously. We give them feedback. We review what they do. We give them correction, and that's how we should be treating um, large language models and Chat GPT as well. Some important tips: if you haven't played around with Chat GPT, um, really the level of uh, interaction that you'll get is really mediated by how good your prompts are. So here's a couple of good tips for writing good prompts. You'll see some example prompts later in our presentation, um, but ask it to adopt a role. Say, pretend that you're a marketing executive or pretend that you know about advertising or pretend that you're a business executive um, or pretend that you're a software engineer. These are all good roles that it can adopt. Um, and uh, because of its training data, it does a pretty good job in my opinion. Uh, you can also ask it to prompt you. Uh, I use this in my own role where I was working on a presentation and I didn't know exactly what types of things I should be trying to answer. And so I had it come up with a series of questions that I could fill out and made for a really good back and forth uh, conversation with ChatGPT and really led me down the right path. Um, be specific, keep the context. ChatGPT in, in particular, you have conversation threads. And so just like you could talk to a person, and you could um, you could go off off topic, and you could you know confuse, and it'd be pretty jarring. You can certainly do that same thing to Chat GPT. However, Chat GPT won't give you a puzzled look like a human will. And uh, so I like to think a little bit differently about Chat GPT. It's not a person. It doesn't have moral agency. It's not sentient. But it's also really not just a calculator. It's a much more complex generative system. I think it's fair to say that it is an artificially intelligent dialogic interface. And the reason why I'd say that is because it is the back and forth, um, the, the, the dialogue that you can have with ChatGPT that really helps you get the most out of it. So a couple of use cases and some pros and cons. Um, I'm taking this mostly from the software development perspective. And in my opinion, ChatGPT is good at coding and it's also bad at coding. And this probably shouldn't be a surprise because most of us are both good and bad at coding. We have our strengths, we have our weaknesses, and understanding how to leverage our strengths is key to our job performance. So I'm gonna give you kind of the good and the bad on different topics. Um, from an architecture and design perspective, I think this is critical. 
it doesn't know what to do. It really only knows how to do it. So if you haven't decided what you need to build or you don't have good customer understanding, if you haven't figured out what, what problem you're trying to solve, it can help you. It can help mediate that, but it can't fill that gap for you. Um, so we definitely need to you know, be uh, diving deep with our customers to understand what problems we're trying to solve. Um, as far as code review, I think that it really won't replace static analysis yet. Those, those tools are pretty mature and are maturing. And because of the limited token size, you can't give it a 10,000 um, line of code uh, file uh, and have it review it for you. Um, so I think that there are some promising things in code review. I'm, I just don't think that it replaces static code analysis yet. Um, probably the biggest way that I use chat GPT in particular is for code generation. Um, now, again, I'm in an open source uh, program. And so uh, the things that we do are publicly available on GitHub. Uh, Jeff's going to be talking a little bit later about the ethical and legal uh, implications. Um, but since I'm working on an open source program, there's a lot, a lot of things I can talk about with it. Um, but specifically, I use code generation for tedious boilerplate code. And this is stuff that takes high concentration. If you make a mistake, it's obviously wrong. It'll be broken. It can be hard to find but it's low creativity, it's high tedious types of things. Um, and quality functions, getters and setters, I think it does a pretty good job at that. I also use it for unit testing. Um, and this does require that you have moderately small sized functions. You know, a, a good rule of thumb in software development, of course it depends on language, is that a function should probably be able to fit on a screen. You know, it should probably not be more than 100, 200 lines long. And part of that is, because we're trying to build shared mental models. And so if a function's 10,000 lines long, it's gonna be pretty hard to follow. Um, but I found that it's pretty good for generating boundary cases. I can describe, here's the contract for this function, help me come up with some different test cases I need to think about, and then actually prompt it to write the code. Um, and I found that that's pretty valuable. Um, another huge way that I use chat GPT is learning how to code. Um, if you're like me, a API and library documentation is generally quite poor. And that's because developers aren't often well motivated to write meaningful documentation. There's also a bit of a bias in that because we're so close to it, what do we explain that we don't already understand? So there's a bit of this um, difference between, you know, we're the experts who wrote the thing, what do people who don't have expertise at our level need to know? Um, but I found that it's really good for breaking down concepts has far less noise than Google. It's kind of my default that I'll use if I'm trying to learn a new library. Um, in my own example, I've done some work with Matplotlib and Pandas, and I don't use it often enough that uh, I you know, have a high degree of fluency in what to do, uh, but I found that I can describe my data frame to chat GPT and say, here's the things I'm trying to do. You know, Give me uh, a line chart, and I want to see it broken down by quarterly numbers. Uh, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's a, um, I'm trying to look at power data or climate data. Um, and what I found is going back to the dialogic aspect, I can say, okay, that's, that's good. I like that. But now modify this so I see it on a daily summation. And I found that I can basically copy and paste that code that it gives me, put it right in my Jupyter Notebook, and um, be rapidly developing, which is a wonderful use case. Uh, some more use cases. I found that it can be helpful in uh, writing documentation and reviewing documentation. So in some cases, I've given it my open API specification. I've asked it to propose changes. Now, I'm not asking it to be a linter. Um, I don't need an open API linter or have one. Um, but back to kind of the cognition side, I'm asking, does this make sense? Are there things that aren't clear to you? If, pretend to be a software developer who needs to use this. What questions would you have? What are areas where maybe I'm contradicting or I'm not giving enough details? Um, now, uh, I've also used ChatGPT for debugging and that's kind of hit and miss. It depends on the complexity. What I do like about it is I can take stack traces and code and say, here's what I'm getting what can you help me with? And I find this is better than Stack Overflow in many regards, because with Stack Overflow, it's very specific answers, but it doesn't always necessarily share your context. And ChatGPT as a context engine, if you give it your code, if you can share your code, if that's an appropriate thing to do, and you can share your stack traces, it can really help you narrow in and what's wrong and decrypt some of those uh, hard to decipher error messages. Um, 
Now, sometimes it will get stuck in loops and it will keep suggesting the wrong thing over and over. That's a bit frustrating. I've had that with a debugging session, but it actually turned out um, one, you know, one in particular that comes to mind is um, I probably spent an hour with it debugging some Go code. And there was a language feature called init functions. I wasn't actually aware that Go had. I was using actually some boilerplate code that ChatGBT had authored for me. And I was having a hard time figuring out what was wrong. And after about an hour, you know, which is a long time to spend on debugging, but I had I had spent some time and I couldn't figure it out. It finally suggested maybe your init functions are out of order. And sure enough, that was the fix. Um, so I think that there's a lot of promise for using it as, as a debugger, using it as pair programming, especially if you're asking questions like, help me do this, or you're trying to drive small automations. I found that it, it can do small automations and scripting uh, really well. It's a polyglot. Um, now, some of the dark sides of coding is it does hallucinate API calls from time to time. Um, so I've been, you know, if I think about pandas, I've asked it to do things and it will come up with a, an API call that looks perfect. It looks exactly what I'm, what I'm looking for it, and I'm surprised that I missed it. And well, the fact is I didn't miss it, it, it didn't exist and it made it up, uh, which means that you really have to verify. Um, I would not trust that I could just say, give an exhaustive list of requirements and come back and find 5,000 lines of code written. I think if you take an iterative approach and you're doing testing along the way, it can be a great assistant, um, but it's not yet at the maturity level where it can do full projects by itself, in my opinion. Um, there are some toy examples online, but um, for more serious software development, I don't think that maturity is quite there. Uh, it is really bad at converting between Python and Go from my own painful experience. It warned me that was a bad idea. Um, I thought I would try it. And Python is a weakly typed, dynamically interpreted language, whereas Go is a strongly typed, compiled language. And so it made a lot of mistakes around variable um, and memory initialization and declaration uh, and data type conversions. Um, so I basically had to rewrite that myself. Uh, finally, it doesn't write in my voice. And that's a problem because up to about 25% of just maintaining software is literally reading it and understanding it. And so if it doesn't write like you, or if it doesn't write in a way that you're used to reading, um, it's going to be hard to build that shared context back up. Some other use cases that I've explored is chat GPT is great at writing. And this is probably no surprise. Um, you can, you know, again, you can have it critique your writing. So Here's an example. I said, act like a college writing professor, review this essay, or here, here's a letter. Help me review it. What suggestions do you have for clarity and flow? Um, or help me rewrite this in an active voice. So it can do really a lot with writing. I, uh, I think that's how I first got exposed to it. Um, I've been very pleased with the capacity that it has. And then, of course, you can also use it to synthesize writing. You know, I could say, chat GPT, give me a list of 10 reasons why cats are fun pets. And then I could say, write a 500 word blog post. Now, maybe that's not super relevant for our day to day, but substitute cats for you know, some industry term and uh, have, it, have it explained why maybe virtualization is a great, is a great choice uh, in, in certain deployment scenarios. Um, along those lines, chat GPT is useful for the research process. Um, now, I want to start with the caveats. It will not replace LexisNexis. It's not great at citations. Sometimes it makes them up. And it definitely will not help you confront your own confirmation bias if you're using it to just confirm what you already think. But I found that it's really good at exploring the boundaries of problem definition. So here's a couple of prompts that I used. And I knew that there was a term that described self-referencing logical arguments, but I couldn't remember what it was. Um, so I said, what is that term? And it gave me a couple of options. And then I started to drill into it. Well, what are some examples of ontological arguments? And what are some other methodologies that are questionable in argumentation like ontology? And how are circular reasoning and ontology similar and different? And what are some other resources? So I, I found that it really helped me define some of the problem space and help me identify what questions I needed to ask as part of my research process. Um, some limitations. All right. If you don't know what to do, again, it will gladly mislead you. If you don't know how to do something, then chat GPT can generally be quite useful. Um, chat GPT is wrong sometimes. It needs guidance, correction, reinforcement. Again, think of it like an intern. We don't um, just give an entire project to interns and then say, I'll see you in three months. I hope it works out. Um, we give them constant feedback. We give them correction. We say, no, this isn't what I'm looking for. 
I need you to go down this path. And I found that that treating it like that is a really good way to get the most out of chat GPT. I like to think of it a bit like the digital Dunning-Kruger effect. And, and that's, that's the phenomenon where people wildly overestimate their capability. Um, I find that that is true for chat GPT. Um, it is confidently incorrect. And it doesn't, you know, when you talk to a person, maybe, you know, I'll go back to my intern example, and I say, describe to me how the project works. And you can tell where they're really confident. Um, and generally, you can also tell where the intern is maybe not that confident, where here's some questions they had, and, and they don't know if this is exactly right. This, they, don't, they don't know if this is what I was looking for. But chat GPT doesn't show that side. Um, it'll say, well, here's the truth, as far as I know. And of course, it doesn't say as far as I know. It'll say, well, here's, here's the truth. And sometimes it can be wrong. Um, and we call those hallucinations. Now, some people call it lying. I understand why we call it lying. But it's a hallucination because, well, chat GPT is not a moral actor. And it genuinely believes that it's giving you accurate information. Um, as, as far as I can tell, there's no intentional deception. But uh, I don't know if I'd be able to detect that. Um, subtle mistakes are hard to identify. If, if your work depends on a high degree of nuance, then it will make nuanced mistakes that can be hard to find. Um, and then finally, there is bias in its model. And so it's important that we don't let it think for, for ourselves. You know, we, we need to think for ourselves. It can help us see the possibilities. And why is there bias? Now, particularly, I see, you know, maybe popularly both right wing and left wing bias. And that's because it's only as good as its training data, which is based off of human activity and human history. And we can see numerous examples where there's been bias or uh, where people have made mistakes, either intentionally or unintentionally. Um, there's a really good book by Kathy O'Neill called Weapons of Math Destruction. And she looks at some of the ethical impacts of machine learning and data science um, and artificial general intelligence. Um, and one good example is basing current mortgage risks on historically redlined neighborhoods. So if you were to develop an algorithm that would help you determine credit worthiness or how unlikely, how likely someone is to default on their mortgage, and if you base that off of historic mortgage data, um, like data, say, for example, in the United States uh, that might be based off of redlining, and if you're not familiar with redlining, it was a systemic practice um, between the 30s and the 70s um, that basically denied people based off of ethnicity or race the ability to get a mortgage. And so they'd literally draw in a red line around the plot mat of a city and they'd say, this is the undesirable zone and we don't give mortgages to people in this zone. Now that discriminatory practice has been ended. Um, it's been outlawed for 50 years, uh, but the implications of that are still there. If I was to train on the last hundred year mortgage data, I would need to make careful consideration how I deal with the uh, overtly biased um, restrictions that were redlining um, and make sure that my system didn't replicate those same flaws. And of course, if you were to you know, talk to people in the 50s, you could actually see on the plot maps where they would use pretty strong racial language and they more or less referred to it as ghettos or slums of certain ethnicities. Now, if AI is to train off of that data, it's probably not going to carry that same racial bias, but because it says, well, people of this ethnicity in this specific geography don't get mortgages, therefore they're a risk today. And we would know that that's not true, but that's where artificial general intelligence is limited and that it can't always explain how it came to the conclusions that it's come to. So I think it's very important for us to um, always be developing within an ethical framework and really driving the question of what are we doing. And that'll take me to Jeff, who is going to talk about legal and ethical considerations. Awesome. Thank you, Andrew. And if you could just go back to the last slide real quick, there's some uh, disclaimers I'd like to make. <laughs> so I am an attorney. Um, I work for Hewlett Packard Enterprise, but I'm not representing Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Uh, you know, what I'm about to share is not legal advice for you, even if you are uh, an employee of the company, and uh, it's not intended to establish an attorney-client relationship. Um, we all know that's the case, but just thought I would spell it out. So, um, you know, in law school, one of the ways that you're graded is uh, like an end of exam uh, writing assignment, and they give you a, like a page or two of material, and your job is to go through that material and identify all of the legal risks 
all of the potential legal issues. And you're essentially graded based on how many issues you can spot. So uh, as I've been you know, working with this technology, as I've been talking with a lot of people, there are a ton of you know, issues that people could spot. And uh, we could spend a whole day talking about them, but these are the three that maybe keep me up at night the most. Uh, it's not an exhaustive list, obviously. But uh, the first one is that you know, there's countries or companies that are outright banning this. So if you work uh, in a country uh, that has banned it, I haven't uh, caught up to see if anyone has banned it today, but I wouldn't be surprised if some countries do. Uh, if your countries like, have specifically banned it, uh, there may be you know, criminal punishment for violating those bans. Obviously, I'm not condoning any sort of behavior, nor are Andrew or, or Shrek on this call. Um, you know, moreover, your company may ban it as well. Uh, there may be le legal implications if your company bans a technology and, and you use it anyway, uh, related to your work. So just something to keep in mind. Um, you know, beyond whether your country or company bans it, there may be specific uses of the technology that may violate uh, confidentiality or, or data policies of, of your company or organization. Uh, it might depend on the specific data that you're passing over to it. Uh, Andrew mentioned open source and you know, that is that that software is intended to be publicly available. But as a as a patent attorney, you know, a lot of the data that we deal with every day isn't designed for a public disclosure. Um, so you want to be very careful about that. Uh, these are things that you should already know about if you're dealing with the data. But don't think just because ChatGPT is able to assist you with your work that somehow it becomes you know acceptable. Um, Beyond some of those issues, there's also a, an issue that's very near and dear to my heart related to intellectual property. Uh, we've been debating this for, I think, at least about a decade now, is what happens if an artificial intelligence invents something? Who owns that invention? Um, and I'll tell you, there's not like a cut and dry answer on this. It's going to depend on the country that you're in. You know, It might depend on the mood of the judges that are reviewing it. And also these laws are, are probably gonna change too. So I know that in the United States, there's been a bunch of uh, you know, legal cases now about a pure AI inventing something. And as far as, you know, the last time I looked at it was that if it's just AI inventing it, then you can't get a patent on it. But what happens if you are collaborating with AI and you come up with an invention together? Uh, I'll show a demo in a couple of slides that kind of shows a sort of a collaborative process by which we were able to develop something. And I think it kind of begs the question, you know, what should be the, the law in this space? Uh, so there's a lot of ambiguity right now, and it might also depend on the platform itself. So uh, I know looking at OpenAI's terms of service, they say that if, you know, if there's any IP that's generated due to prompts and responses using their service, that uh, they would assign the rights, the IP rights to the user. Uh, this was the last time I checked, maybe they've changed it since then. But that's at least one thing to consider if you look at the terms of use, you know, do, do these services imply or, you know, even try to contractually say that you would get the rights to any IP that's generated from it. You know, if you're using OpenAI, it might be a different answer than if you're using uh, Russia's uh, large language model, the, um, I think it's called GigaChat. So, you know, you got to be careful about the tools that you're actually using. Andrew, if you go to the next slide, I can talk about you know, beyond just the legal aspects uh, where you might actually, you know, face criminal or civil penalties, there also are some ethical considerations. Essentially, just because you can do it, you know, should you? And these are three things that, again, you know, keep me up at night. Uh, for many people, the use of this technology, it, it just feels wrong. There's something, something about it. They can't always put their finger on it. It, it seems too easy. Uh, it seems too easy to pass yourself off as an expert uh, because, you know, the magic words on the screen told you what to say. And, um, you know, beyond an individual's own ethical considerations, they may want to avoid it just because it's controversial, because maybe there's an appearance of impropriety on use. So putting aside your own thoughts, if other people think it's, you know, improper to use, you know, I think there's a lot of individuals that wouldn't even want to bother with it because it's so controversial. Um, beyond other people's opinions, I, I think a lot of people are worried that they could potentially become dependent on the technology. You know, you can imagine if you can build tools in the span of hours 
you know, maybe that will become your metric next year uh, from your manager. And then if somehow the tools go away or you're not able to use them, you know, it's, it's going to be your issue to deal with. Um, and then finally, in the feels wrong category is that, you know, for a, a lot of these things that the AI can do are, have been traditional human endeavors. So, uh, you know, as an attorney, you know, attorneys, humans are the people that are making these legal, you know, considerations and strategy. And it's, you know, not until recently that AI is able to uh, compete and, and actually outperform attorneys on things like the bar exam, as, as Andrew mentioned. And I think for a lot of people, they feel very uncomfortable uh, handing over the reins of, of intelligence to an artificial system. Uh, so beyond just it feeling wrong, this technology actually is wrong uh, very often. Andrew touched on that as well. It can hallucinate facts. Uh, from my own experience, I see that it, I've found that it's uh, it's it's really good at hallucinating quotes that are perfect for your argument. And then when you look into it to see if, you know, like Tina Fey really made this quote, you find out it was just made from, you know, <laughs> made up on the spot. Um, so you got to be very careful about that. And the analogy that I give is that if you're, you know, baking a cake and you ask ChatGPT for a recipe, you know, it could very easily say you need 40 cups of flour um, when you really only need four cups of flour because 40 to a large language model might be a lot more similar than, than four than it would be to human intuition. So you always wanna kind of figure out what guardrails you can put in place um, you know, to compensate for its tendency to make things up. Um, and then finally, this is like a human issue is that there's this strong temptation to use it. Uh, Andrew mentioned confirmation bias and uh, essentially it'll, tell, it'll give you exactly what you want. So if you want an argument for why a hot dog should be considered a sandwich. It'll give you a great argument, uh, but maybe you owe it to yourself to consider both sides. And I mean, there's ways that you can use the tool to say, come up with the pros and cons of this argument, come up, you know, pretend that you're on the other side, let's have a debate. But you just have to be very careful about, uh, you know, starting with a conclusion and then just asking for it to, you know, help you persuade other people because you might be doing a disservice to them as well. Next slide, please. So with that said, you may think that I'm like very hesitant to use this technology, but anyone who knows me knows that I, I'm really excited about it. Uh, I, you know, one of the hats that I wear at the company at Hewlett Packard Enterprise is as a citizen developer. And uh, this is essentially somebody who isn't, you know, a trained or educated software developer, but somebody who can kind of, you know, manipulate things and, and can build tools that are actually solving real problems within the company. Uh, so I'm really curious to see, you know, how can we actually use this for, for like a real life solution? Uh, one, one disclaimer on this as well is that uh, you got to be very careful if you're executing any sort of generative AI created code on your machine. Employ these techniques at your own risk. And, uh, you know, there's ways that, you know, that you can maybe uh, prevent issues with this, such as um, developing in, in virtualized environments, not using your work machines. I would recommend all those things uh, and maybe even having a conversation with your own cyber department or, or IT department. Next slide, please. So with that, I wanted to build a proof of concept. So I was just on parental leave earlier this year and I was so interested in this technology that I wanted to you know, put it through the paces to see if I could build a web app. And, and you can see I, there's a little animation on the right side that shows like a working answer bot that I was able to create a, really in the span of like one or two days maybe around eight hours or so of, of development. And uh, I'll tell you some of the success criteria that I was uh, that I wanted to achieve with this. Oh, and by the way, this is not an officially approved app or anything. This is just a proof of concept that I wanted to create. Um, but I wanted to use primarily copy and paste. I didn't want to ask it, how do I change the background to be blue? And then it tells me, and then I go in and I kind of make those changes itself. I wanted to avoid having to like learn the syntax on some of these programming languages and just like rely on the code itself. Uh, again, this is like a demonstration of the art of the possible. Uh, I wanted to be a React web app. I, I don't have experience with React. I have a little bit of experience with JavaScript and HTML, but I've never used React before. I didn't even know where to start. Uh, I wanted it to use HPE's design system. So these are things like the colors, the icons, the fonts that you see on the screen now. And I wanted it to like feel like an official HPE app, even though it's not actually an official one. Uh, responsive design, I wanted it to expand or to contract based on the screen size. So if you're 
doing on your phone, it'll kind of resize and reposition the elements compared to doing it on your laptop. Uh, I wanted to actually connect to an OpenAI API. Uh, I didn't just want it to be a dummy app. I wanted to like actually be able to provide a service. Uh, containerize it via Docker. Uh, this, the rationale behind that was like, I wanted, if one day we were able to build it using AI, I wanted to make it as easy as possible to migrate around uh, so that it's, you know, there's a very small migration cost that would go into actually bringing this to life. And then uh, finally deploying it on the cloud platform, uh, just as a proof of concept to see if I could get it up there. Um, I really have no experience in any of these spaces outside of the design system uh, because I've used that for some of the existing apps. So if you go to the next screen, I can tell you how I was able to build this, uh, you know, actual working proof of concept. And, uh, you know, you can see, I, you know, if you look at the question I ask is, can you code React in PyCharm? How do you begin? Right? Like, that's how basic, that's how basic it is. And it can start to give you answers. And I won't go through the whole description, but essentially what it said was, sure, you could do that. Because that's what I'm familiar with, because I do a little bit of py Python development. Uh, but it said, you, you know, you probably want to use WebStorm, which is another IDE that's made by the same company. So I was able to use it to basically set that up on my machine. You know, it tells you web pages to go to. It tells you code to include. Again, you know, if there's any security experts on the call, they're probably like pulling their hair out. Uh, so you know, you need to be extremely careful about actually doing this. But again, this is about the art of the possible. Uh, go to next slide, please. So the you know the next thing I asked was how can I essentially make this look like an official HPE app? Uh, so the way that I phrased the question was how do I import components from HPE's design system into React? And uh, fortunately, there is like a publicly available open source, um, you know, library called Gromit. I think it's one of HPE's most popular open source libraries. And uh, it showed me how to do it. So again, it's using NPM to install things. Uh, I've never used NPM before. Uh, so I, that, that was one of the questions that I asked. Uh, I'm only showing the highlights of the, of the questions. You can probably assume that I spent, you know, two or 300 back and forth questions just to, just to bring this to life. Next slide, please. Um, so now we're getting into the meat of the app. Uh, so I asked it very generally, you know, can you write code to create a web app that follows these guidelines, including page layouts for a chatbot type experience? And uh, amazingly, it was able to do it. It uh, created a couple of different JavaScript files, or it asked me to create a couple of files, which I was able to do with, with copy and paste. Um, but the original version of this, I, I wish I took a screenshot, but I didn't realize that this would actually work, <laughs> was uh, it was just a very ugly chatbot. It was, you know, the, the text area took up the whole screen, even on a wide monitor. And it, you know, it, it was, it looked like a chatbot, but it, it wasn't really styled in, in any like compelling way. So if you go to the next slide, the next question I asked it was, oh, actually, so during this whole process, you get errors occasionally because it can hallucinate. So what I was able to do was, uh, you know, you literally just putting in the error message and then it would, it would respond. And if you see the response here, it says, you know, apologies for the confusion. It seems that I missed adding, you know, this statement. So it's, it, it really feels like a human that you're operating with, uh, where it's making mistakes and it's apologizing. It's, it's a really surreal uh, experience. If you go to the next slide, oh, one caveat on inputting error messages is sometimes there might be like sensitive info in the error message. So you just wanna be careful about that. If you go to the next slide. Cool. So uh, now I got to the stage of trying to format it to look nice. Uh, I said, hey, the chatbot is too wide. Can you make it take up less screen space and add a margin? So this is kind of where the human element comes in because I could see what it was generating and I was able to go back and say, you know, that doesn't look right. Can you make it you know, better? Next slide. Uh, this, this is a really interesting space. So it's not just about giving it the exact commands and then it responds. So I wanted to experiment with basically adding content. So I said, look, you know, the side panel should have some buttons on it that would make sense on a side panel for this app, right? So, so it's basically saying like, knowing that this is a chat bot, what would a side panel look like? And it's like, okay, well, profile settings help chat history in and about. And one thing that was kind of, surprising about this was that it also identified icons that were in our part of our design system that it found were relevant. So, you know, the icon at the top for profile is just called, I think it's just called user. So it knew that profile should have the user icon. 
And this was a uh, kind of a surprise that it would actually go that far as well. Next slide. Uh, then I wanted to connect it to the OpenAI's API. It told me how to do that. Next slide. Uh, then, you know, I've never used containers. I'm familiar with them, but I've never actually used it before. So I say, how do I host it uh, so it can run on my app, you know, my phone or any internet connected device? I, I didn't want it to, you know, only be behind a firewall. Just again, as an art of the possible experiment. So it gave me some suggestions there. I was able to get that set up as well. Uh, next slide. And then uh, for 10 years, and then, you know, Andrew was kind of talking about this. So I said, uh, all right, so I have this code, it works. And, you know, but I'm sure it's horrible by, you know, most software developer standards, even though it does work, which, you know, maybe has its own uh, merit. But I said, pretend that you're a software architect and provide a critique and provide some specific examples. So I went through it, it gave some suggestions and um, I didn't actually do this because the proof of concept was already built. But uh, what you could do is go through, you can say, based on this response, how would you rewrite it? And then it would, it would tell you what to do and you can copy and paste it. Next slide. So uh, just finally, uh, on my last slide, just some takeaways on this is that it's it's a really weird experience where you feel like you're programming with AI. You're not just telling it to do something and then sitting back and you know having a drink. Like you're, it's like a collaborative uh, process where you're seeing what it generates. You're saying, no, that's not good enough. Make it better. Uh, it's it's really it's really interesting. Um, and you know there are no dumb questions. You can see a lot of my questions were probably pretty dumb. You know, can you code in PyCharm? And uh, you don't have to worry about the uh, the AI kind of uh, rolling their eyes at you or you know being busy with their own things. They, they can help you twenty four seven, or at least until you run out of the uh, you know the number of chats in you know a three hour period. Uh, I also recommend being ambitious with your request. So you can see one of mine was to basically create a chatbot type experience. And uh, you know alternatively, I could have said, well, how do you create like a chat bubble? Right, and go from there. But I find like if you give it a very high level start point, that can be useful. Um, you should really embrace the iteration here. Is like try to get something like structured first, and then just make it better. So I started. I I made a chatbot, and then I just made it better over time. I, I find that that helps you with encouragement versus you know not knowing if it's going to work until you know you're at the end of the time. Uh, modularization is your friend. Uh, one of the pain points was copying and pasting the entire like. JavaScript file into it. And sometimes I'd have to use tokens to ask it to continue. But if you if I would have followed that approach that Angie mentioned of just like one, you know, screen per um per function or per JavaScript file, I think that would have helped a lot. Uh, and then finally, maybe the most important is that if there are human review processes in place, like a cybersecurity process or IT processes before you're actually deploying code, you should definitely employ them. Uh, and ultimately, they're going to be the deciders if whether your code passes muster. And uh, you know, if you think about it, you could actually take some of the feedback to the extent that it's not sensitive or confidential, and put that into the AI as well, and say, you know, write it in the same voice as Andrew. Here's an example of some of Andrew's code, and then uh, use it for that. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Shrek to uh, talk about some really some other really interesting topics as well. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh, next slide, please. So far, we've talked a lot about ChatGPT. It's certainly one of the most popular large language models. But I'd like to point out that there are many different generative AI tools that you can use to generate code. You may have heard of some of these, such as GitHub's Copilot. Many of these tools integrate directly with popular IDEs, such as Visual Code, PyCharm, or IntelliJ IDEA. Um, you'll also find that many of these tools are open source. And... Many capable tools are small enough that you can actually run them on your own hardware, at least behind the firewall uh, in your own company. Hugging Face, which is uh, at huggingface.co, is a major open source hub for collaboration on models and data sets, and it even provides infrastructure for running some of these models. Some of these tools are purpose-built uh, for a specific language or application, and the space is exploding. I uploaded these slides, I think, a couple of days ago. They're already out of date. <laughs> Next slide. Many uh, other solutions uh, are emerging to help developers. Uh, I think the first thing I'd like to highlight is that some of these tools support plugins that extend the functionality to include actions. And this can be quite powerful. 
ChatGPT has opened up their beta plugins to everybody who is on the ChatGPT Plus plan. Uh, there are plugins for browsing, interrogating PDFs or web content at specific links. There are plugins that give uh, product development coaching or can summarize video content. And there's a mind-boggling plugin called Code Interpreter that's currently in alpha status, at least as of this morning. Uh, and you can use that plugin to upload a spreadsheet or other data. It will automatically perform data analytics and generate insights. It's truly remarkable. You'll, you'll issue a prompt. It will generate Python code that it thinks it needs to help solve the problem. It will run the code and then it will interact with you. So don't enter, don't, I guess I'd say don't overlook the power of plugins in these various tools. Uh, you'll also find tools that specialize in test generation, security assessments, generating documentation from code. Other important tools you'll find include video summarization, and automated note-taking tools, the ULearn platform that I have in one of these uh, screenshots is one example of a generative AI tool that can help you digest online training videos rapidly and can even generate class notes for you, which is nice. And as Jeff mentioned, you can get some help with experience design uh, that can also be used with these tools. Some tools are better at front-end work and some tools are better at back-end work. Uh, and building on the idea of plugins that enable a large language model to take actions, there are experimental tools that can create agency and autonomy. So you may have heard of AutoGPT. It's one example of this. It adds actions and some vector memory to enable multi-step goal seeking. So you can specify a goal you'd like to accomplish, and the model will do its best using chain of thought to outline the steps that have to be taken to achieve the goal, and then will, with your permission, execute commands and do further uh, uh, prompt generation to try to solve the problem. There's also an option that allows the tool to operate autonomously where it won't ask permission. It'll just keep going. I don't recommend using the autonomous operation. Given the limited context window of GPT-4, it's easy to get into action loops. And even if you don't get into an infinite loop, uh, you're paying for the API calls and those calls call, costs can run up quickly uh, as this thing goes off and executes multiple calls over and over again in a short period of time. Agent GPT is a web extension that builds on auto GPT to make goal-driven AI a bit friendlier. If you're just getting started with some automation here, Agent GPT is a, a great place to start uh, exploring uh, providing agency and autonomy uh, to these large language models. I found these tools are great for automating research and other interactive tasks with the web. And uh, all of these things are available right now. And really, when you think about it, these are really early days for this. There's a lot more coming and it's coming fast and furious. Next slide. So where is all this going? Next slide. Whether you look at adoption rates or capability growth or capacity or performance, the growth of generative AI is unprecedented. We have never seen technology grow at this rate in our lifetimes. ChatGPT adoption reached a million users in five days, 100 million users in two months. There's an explosion of large language models. In March and April of this year, we had 17 major LLMs introduced. Hugging Face, which I mentioned earlier, has over 200,000 models, and the daily growth is stunning, and the capability growth is equally surprising. When you continue, continue to think about uh, text-to-image models that have gone from crude art to photorealistic image generation in a bit over a year, and exam performance, as was mentioned earlier on GPT-3, 3.5, and 4, have gone from somewhat interesting to dominating human performance in about the same time frame across a number of topics, it's really hard to imagine where we're going to be in a year. And as a species, we're really good at making linear projections. Well, exponential projections are kind of unnatural for us, and double exponential growth is almost impossible for us to fathom, at least in terms of projecting where the puck is going to be in some time frame. Next slide. 
So most experts have been surprised by the growth of large language models and their capabilities and the impact on the advancement of AI. Their predictions have been very wrong. Here's a widely cited chart by Hans Moravec that was meant to depict the advance of AI capabilities as a rising tide, eventually submerging classes of problems where the toughest problems occupied the highest peaks. Notice that creative endeavors occupy some of the highest peaks, and today's large language models have already put some of those peaks underwater. Next slide. Now, until recently, the most promising models have been those that increase the number of parameters or, or weights in these models. They've just been scaling up and up and up. But recent work by DeepMind with the Chinchilla model revealed that there's a balance between the model size and the number of examples used in the training that better predicts model performance. And so you'll find the newest models might be a bit smaller than the largest ones, but train on more data. In fact, trillions of tokens at this point. And with optimally balanced models and training data, the capabilities are scaling with size. Next slide, please. I think the most intriguing thing about scaling these large language models are the emergent capabilities, particularly the ones that nobody predicted. So by November, yeah, November of last year, researchers had cataloged 137 emergent abilities with these large language models. This is an active area of research with exciting developments each day. For example, one study demonstrated that large language models that exhibited superior reasoning capability seem to develop this as a consequence of being trained on code examples. So we're learning more and more about how some of these emergent abilities show up and, and what makes them materialize as we scale these models up to higher and higher levels. We've talked a lot about hallucinations and it's a very real problem. And one of the active areas of research is grounding where hallucinations will become less and less prevalent and more, more and more of this will be fact-based. Um, that could be very soon. It could be this year that we see a lot of advancement in that area. Now, the dramatic increase in capabilities is causing researchers to sort of reset their expectations for when artificial general intelligence, that's the point where most agree that AI can perform any intellectual task any human could perform and when that might emerge. Most experts thought that development was decades away prior to 2017. Now some are predicting months or a couple of years. It's difficult to tell since a lot of these developments seem to fit that double exponential progression. Next slide, please. So this leads to some burning questions. Now, one of the most interesting for me in the open source program office at HPE is whether open source communities will be the primary driver of growth in the future. Open collaboration is incredibly powerful and the success of Hugging Face suggests we'll see a lot of innovation there. On the other hand, the largest of these models demand access to a great deal of compute, storage, and networking. Large private companies and governments have access to those resources. We're seeing a lot of large companies become increasingly proprietary about sharing information about these models. In the past, they've been very, very open about the training data, the size of the models, how they're organized. It's been much more of a research or an academic environment. Now, this latest move toward more proprietary work that might be driven in part by open source work or other fast followers that are coming up with quite capable models in a very short period of time following some of these developments. Some have stepped forward and have declared that open source will dominate in this space. I tend to fall in that camp, but there are countervailing forces at work. Companies want to protect their trade secrets and the billions of dollars they're investing in this area. There's also an arms race in this space and a lot of fear about what this AI may be capable of doing and the threats that might materialize. As a result, governments around the world face a lot of pressure to regulate this technology. Export controls, licensing, and other measures may materialize and affect the ability for communities to collaborate in this space. Time will tell. As for the other burning questions listed here, I'm going to leave those for you to contemplate. Depending on your perspective, 
We live in an incredibly exciting or potentially terrifying moment in history, and we each play a part in how it will play out. We'll see. I tend to be optimistic about these things. Next slide. Now, for what it's worth, I do have some recommendations for developers. And of course, I'll reiterate what Jeff said earlier. These are my opinions, not necessarily the opinions of my company. So the first thing to try uh, is to keep abreast of the latest developments in this space. It's difficult. Things happen every single day. If you're not tracking this weekly, you run the risk of being out of touch. In a matter of months, if you don't track this, you may no longer recognize this space. That's how fast this is changing. Next, I personally recommend you use generative AI tools. Think of them as an extension of your brain. There are a lot of benefits we've talked about today, and this is just a partial list on the slide of some of the benefits that you can get, but these benefits are all available right now. I heard a great quote some time ago uh, by a professor, I think it was a law professor, and he said, AI will not replace attorneys, but attorneys that use AI will replace those who do not. I think the same is true for software engineers and developers. And until grounding is part of these models, they are going to hallucinate. It's just the way they work. So you must always be the responsible adult in the room with generative AI tools. Check the facts, check the output, make sure that you understand what's going on and that you have run these things to ground and, and make sure that uh, hallucination is not creating problems for you. Finally, I'd suggest make use of the rich APIs that are available. Use tools like Langchain and other tools to build custom AI solutions that become part of your tool belt and the value you deliver. And finally, I'd say embrace and enjoy this exciting time. It is a wonderful time. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you, guys. That was incredible. I think uh, we had a lot of uh, discussion in the chat. I don't know if we will be able to respond to all of these questions. Um, there were a few questions for you, Jeff, in the Q&A about uh, um, did you copyright, for example, the, um, the little application? Would, would you have copyrighted uh, the application HPE? copyright or in the same line would you uh, consider something developed by ai an invention an invention uh, i think that that raised the same questions um yeah i think you know all these questions are up in the air right now um i personally would consider it an invention but i'm not you know a judge uh, i think each country is going to have their own you know thoughts on this and uh you know this technology is very new right now and it's only been six months and uh you know laws take some time to catch up so I'm not sure how it's all going to shake out right now um i think we we're running out of time uh thanks everyone <laughs>